Oh, what a lovely pair. Mr. Tweed, that better be feathery boobies. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Tweed's Garage. Well, in this video, uh, we're carrying on with the BSA B175 Bantam project. Um, if you didn't see the last video, I got the engine out of the bike and started to strip it down, and we were discovering little horrors that were in there. Um, and this video, we follow on, um, take all the ancillaries off, split the cases, and find out what was going on inside. Um, if you haven't seen the last video, I'll put a little link down below so you can find that one. Um, but for the rest of you, let's come along and have a look. So I've got it all on the bench. Come on, let's have a look. So the next thing we need to do is remove the primary drive gear and the clutch assembly. So I can split the cases and uh, check the crank out. Um, so first thing we need to do, having looked in the manual, there is a special tool for disassembling the clutch. You need to compress it to remove the retaining spring that's uh, just on the inside edge of the uh, clutch basket. Um, I suppose there's ways you could do it, but it looks fairly easy type of tool to manufacture. So it's time to uh, dip into the scrap bin. Yeah, this bit of stainless to do. Might be a bit hard, but we'll give it a go. So over to the lathe with a piece of stainless steel. Then we'll centre drill it and uh, run a drill all the way through because this will be, become my locating hole for the uh, shoulder on my pressure bolt. And then just work away at it, sort of drill it with a bigger drill to get a boring bar in there. gradually work away at it. It did prove quite hard as you can see as the normal uh, high speed steel tooling it blunted quite quickly. Um, yeah I've had, machined a bit of this stuff before and it does, uh, does burn out your tools quite quickly. So I tried a smaller boring bar but that was uh, singing too much and uh, we was starting to burn the tip up a bit so then I switched to this uh, sturdier Sandvik boring bar that I picked up from that factory sale and uh, that worked quite well once I figured out that you just got to take big fast cuts with it and uh, just chomp it away so just bored out the inner recess this is to allow clearance around the uh, pressing on the on the spring pressure plate on the clutch And then I turned down a shoulder on the outside edge so that this, this would just sit in inside this, the outer spring pressure plate and uh, locate it and stop it sliding about. So I made the rebate 48 millimetres. And then the outer diameter of the flange, 51 millimetres, that gives you about half a mil clearance. And then the actual outer diameter of the whole thing was uh, 
just under 60 millimeters. That gives it clearance inside the spring holders. And with that done, let's take it out, flip it over, finish the outer dimension on the outside face, and then just uh, face it off, just to finish it up a bit. I've got this old coach bolt that I think will do. Cut it down a bit, I didn't need all that length on it, so I just parted it off. And then turned a little shoulder on it, so I had a locating peg on the end and made that sort of six millimetres, just under six millimetres to go in my location hole on the pressure pad of the compressor. And then with those two parts made, then I've got this flat steel bar that's just thick enough to fit between the basket and the uh, clutch gear. So I'll get on and work out my measurements. Blew up the steel bar. Mark it out with where I need my bends. I drilled the hole already in the uh, flat bar and tapped it as well and then popped it into the uh, vice bender jaws that I've got and uh, bent up the frame for the compression tool. And then with those two parts made, um, I drilled the hole already in the uh, flat bar and tapped it as well so that I could initially run the bolt through fairly square and then I ran a nut down on the inside, made sure it wasn't done up too tight and uh, tack welded it in place. And it all seemed to work okay. So I sort of pop that on and um, release the pressure. But I did find I'd left it a little bit too tight. I was trying to make the arms as short as possible to stop any flex. I wasn't sure what sort of pressure was going to be there when I released it. And uh, yeah, I made the arms a little bit too short to have the nut on the inside of the puller. So. Ground off, the, uh, ground off the nut and then welded it onto the outside and, and actually that is the same as the, as the uh, picture of the puller in the book actually. The, it's the, got the uh, threaded collar on the outside to give you a bit more clearance on the inside. And then with that done, pop it on, do it up and it compresses the springs beautifully. Really easy with that sort of compressed just flick out the locating ring and uh, release the pressure on your clutch compressor. 
take it off and just uh, you can take your clutch apart and take out the spring plate with all its uh, springs and then remove all the clutch pressure plates and friction plates and that allows you to get to the nut on the inside to uh, release the rest of the clutch from the shaft and then it suddenly became obvious where that damage came from on the kickstart shaft I think they must have been jamming something against it and then on the the inner gear of the the uh, clutch to be able to undo or tighten the nut not sure which way um, you can get a holding spanner I haven't got one so I thought I'd just give it a go I'll sort of just loosely assemble the clutch assembly so I can sort of push my thumb against the friction plates and hold it in a rag and uh, with my trusty uh, impact driver just gave it a quick whiz with that and uh, yeah it's a, it's a marvellous tool it just yeah, just knocked it off before before the had a chance to start moving around in my hand um, so yeah it comes to rescue again if, uh, if you're ever thinking about getting one yeah get one I don't regret, regret the day I bought it it's become so useful around the workshop for all sorts of things so yeah with that off we take the clutch off slide all that off um, there is wear on the roller bearing but there's also wear which is quite common on the bronze bronze and steel in a bush for the clutch um, struggling to find one of those at the moment I'm looking but um, yeah there don't seem to be any stock of them I'm not sure where I could make one I could make could make one I think it's just a bit involved because it's got um, a steel inner pressed into a phosphor bronze outer so you'd have to sort of make the steel in a first push that in into the phosphor bronze a bit thicker and then machine that down so we may have to do that so with that done we moved on to removing the uh, crank sprocket and you've got to be really careful with this you can't just put a puller on the end of the shaft um, because it's sort of got a taper on it this is what the points cam goes on to and it's got a hole down the middle of it it's very thin and easy to damage um, there's a little bit of damage on mine but only at the very edge luckily it hasn't sort of splayed it out or mushroomed it out the points cam was on there really tight so in the book it says about a um, protector bolt that screws in before you put the puller on but um, I haven't got one of them so what I decided to do was make a little aluminium support it would rest on the taper on the end of the shaft and uh, sort of a bit of judicious measuring and having a look at it I worked it out as roughly eight degrees I needed to set my cross slide over to to um, bore a taper in a piece of aluminium which would go over the end of the shaft so I first bored the hole out to well, I think it's 7.7 .7 millimeters which is sort of the, the very end diameter of the shaft and then with a very small boring bar I bored out the inner face at an 8 degree angle until I got my um, my outside diameter got down to just 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 below the diameter of the shaft at the bottom of the taper so with that done I just sort of uh, faced it off so it's neat and tidy parted it off flipped it over and in a small centre drill just uh, drilled it out so I had a little um, countersunk hole in so that the uh, tip of the uh, puller screw would, would rest in that and then just place it on the end of the shaft put the puller on and then start tightening up the puller and then tighten it up a little bit more and a little bit more and this gear is on a taper yeah and there it goes and everything lands in a heap but success so remove all that give the button a little little tap to release the taper and then just check the end of the shaft and that all looks okay so now with that off and the clutch assembly off taking all the uh, spacers and everything off off the shafts it's time to turn the engine round and start undoing all the bolts so I need to get all these screws undone 
and then we should be able to split the cases but they're all a bit tight so a little bit of the old impact wrench which works ever so well because it's pushing into the screw head rather than trying to wind itself out every time you tap it and it works really well and they're a bit of a sort of forgotten forgotten thing bit of adaptation to get onto the Phillips screws there we go everyone's a winner hopefully Even the ones that have had slots cut into them going undone. There we go. Now I would like to keep these uh, cross edge screws, but they're all pretty mullered, so we might have to change it to cap edge screws. Which isn't, in, which isn't quite in keeping with the look of the bike, but needs must when the devil drives. Oh, I think that's the size they used to be. And I'll carry on, but you're getting in the way. One cap head screw on it already. Lovely job. That's the easy bit, just got to split the cases now. All the screws are out, so it's time to take it out of the frame and wrestle around with it on the bench and uh, get it apart. So with the engine out of the cradle, I can just show the quick and dirty frame I made. It's just a couple of pieces of scrap angle iron I had lying around, welded up. The sort of profile of the engine cut out for it to fit in and holes drilled for the engine mounts. And then it just slots in the vice like that. Either way, so you can work on both sides of the engine. Works quite well. Engine off, on the bench. Okay. Now there's meant to be two engine dowels, one in here and one in here. But I think I think they're missing and um yeah somebody's used slightly bigger engine bolts to clamp it all together. So let's see if we can get it apart. back in a little while. Oh no, there is a dowel in there. Just couldn't see them. There we go. There's the crank seal, there's the crank, there's the stuffer plate missing. Zoom you in a bit. Boop. 
So yeah, stuff a plate missing there, broken screw there. Let's have a look at the damage on the inside of the case. Oh yeah, that's been having a jolly old time spinning round in there before it exited uh, stage left. Yeah, not sure what that is. So dates of flood in the crankcases. Yeah. But not not horrendous. I was just just looking at the uh, crank seal. And it's been running on the crankshaft there. If I'm not mistaken, because it was this way. I would have said it goes goes that way. Which doesn't help. Okay, found another use for this uh, little tool. Take that out before it falls out. I reckon that can go on there rather than beating the end of this. I can use that to tap the crank out. Let's give it a go. There we go. Double use tool. That's what we like. It's all falling apart. <sighs> there we go. Yeah, that one was around the right way. That one was in the wrong way. Obviously taking a 50-50 chance. And there's the stuffer plate that should be on that side of the crank. So this is missing. I have to make a new stuffer plate to go on there. And I think it might be a combination of Loctite in it, screwing it, and then welding the, welding the screws in place so they don't come undone. But if you need to get it undone, they can be ground back and you can take it out. So here's some of the problems. The first one is, which I knew about and suspected had happening, this uh, stuffer plate is missing. It's obviously come loose and then this screw was gouged round inside the housing, causing untold, untold noise and damage here. And then eventually the screw's flown out and um, gone up above the piston, routed around, Damage the piston a bit and cause some damage in the cylinder head, which I thought may have caused a problem with, with the crank. And it has, you can sort of, it was sort of obvious when I took it out to my eye, but it's very difficult to see with a straight edge. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, but if I just put it there, you can see it sits flat on this one, on this on the right hand side. There's actually actually a gap under the left hand side, and it gets worse depending on where you move to where the two crank sides have been knocked out of true. And then and then go around the other side. Then this one is higher than this side. So so I, I can't demonstrate because I'm holding with uh, holding the camera. But yeah, so one of these has been twisted that way around the crank pin. Not a lot, just enough. So I think that would give me my problem of the stator of the alternator being going round like this and then not being able to 
gap it properly. You know, it was tight on one, in one spot, but that spot would move around. So that would suggest that this was wobbling around like this, caused by this crank pin at a slight angle. And also that would cause this wear here, where the um, con rod was being forced over, was sliding over. And there's also wear in the barrel on one side where the piston has been pushing over. So it's not a major, major problem. It seems like a catastrophe, um, but the bearing is good up and down. There's a bit of side to side, but that's fairly normal, but there's no up and down play on it. So that's okay. So what I need to do is support the, uh, put, the be put some bearings on the crank, put it on some V blocks and uh, square it all up and then run it round and clock each side of the uh, crankshaft here and here and find out where it's uh, which side's running out and then with a sort of uh, judicious application of a copper mallet bang one side round compared to the other so another problem we had was the, there was no gearbox oil but there was gearbox oil in the crank cases and uh, when I took it off you may have seen that this oil seal had been rubbing against the uh, crankshaft there and the reason for that is it was on the wrong way it should be that way round so it keeps the crankcase sort of airtight and uh, oil tight um, and this is under sort of vacuum and, and pressure this this side isn't this side is to uh, keep the oil contained for the main bearings so as I said in a previous video, the BSA bantam very slightly to uh, normal two-stroke practice is that the uh, main bearings are mounted outside of the crankcases and the oil seals. So normally on two-strokes, it's the two-stroke oil mix lubricates this bearing, big end bearing, small end bearing, and your main bearings. But on the... Uh, Bantam, what happens is oil is thrown up in the gearbox down that hole there. It runs down and that drilling goes through here and comes out here. And then there's a corresponding hole at the bottom, one there and then drilling goes through this casting. And then the oil drains back into the gearbox there. So the main runs on gearbox oil. So the oil seal, the inner oil seal, because it's not under pressure, it's just sort of gravity fed oil. Uh, this stops the oil going into the crank cases. And then there's one which I have taken off on the outside, stop the oil falling out this way. So, hopefully, putting the new one in, putting it the correct way around, should sort the gearbox oil problem out. So, sort of, so get in there, get in there. So, crank, disappearing oil, uh, kick start. I thought it was play in this bush. This is the bush. This one, um, there is wear on this. There's quite a bit of wear on this, but there's also wear on the on the gearbox bearing output the other side to the clutch um, but problem here is the first tooth can you see it's all rounded off and munched down so this is allowing it to catch on the top of the gear corresponding gear on the clutch sometimes and jamming it so currently trying to uh, source a decent kickstart gear to replace that but with that done and a new bush and new bearings hopefully all the play will uh, be taken out of the clutch gearbox is all fine it's all good uh dogs are good gears gears are good selectors no no problems there i don't think we've got anything to worry about there now on the piston and cylinder side of it uh piston rings are knackered 
I don't know if you can actually see there, don't know where it comes out on video. You can actually tell by eye that this here is thinner than the rest of the piston ring where it's been where it's been uh, wearing. Uh, the little pin gaps have nearly got worn away. They should be, yeah, it should be more like that one. See, it should have a little little tang each side. This this one's disappeared, and that one's so thin it's it's just about hanging on. Um, and also, you should measure the gap between there and there with feeler gauges, but it's so big, even if allowing for the tang still being there, you could still you can measure it with a ruler. So they, these are well past their sell-by date. There is a bit of wear on the barrel. I think where that crank's been kicking out, there's a little bit of wear inside and a little ridge sort of at the bottom bottom there uh, and a, yeah and a ridge slight ridge at the top so you can see where the rings have been running um, measuring the piston gaps it's well within tolerance down the bottom and it's just a couple of thou thou a couple of thou over the over tolerance at the top um, Cleaning this piston off, we discovered this is a this is a thirty thou oversize, which are sort of unobtainable now. You can get twenty thou, forty thou. Uh, you can go sixty thou, then things are going to start getting a bit thin. Um, and as these things are, you know, getting rarer, you're not going to get a new old stock one. So you want to sort of hang on to them. You don't want to keep reboring them just for the sake of reboring them. So it's uh, what I'll probably do is try and locate a set of new old stock rings, give it a light honing and uh, pop it back together and um, run, it, run it that way for now. You know, if it sort of wears out again, then, then it can go 40 thou, 40 thou piston. Um, yeah, and off we go that way. So that's the plan on there. And the other thing was this crankcase repair where the chain's obviously broken at some time, whether it was due to the screw and the stuffer plate causing the carnage and causing the bike to seize up and snap the chain. I don't know, but this, is, this has been repaired, but I think there might be a bit of a gap between that and the top cover that allows all the muck to get in there. Yeah, you can see see where the case is pushed together and there's sort of light coming through there. It's not quite... Flush fitting faces. So it needs a bit of a ten tension there. I mean, I could just slap some gasket sealer on, but it's not the not the best way. Might try and run a bead of bead of weld down on the top, build it back up again, and machine it back down again. There's also a sort of pin pinhole there as well, and a bit of a gap at the top. So that needs sorting out. So there you go. Not too bad. Got a few options. We can rebuild him, as I said. Six million dollar man, Steve Austin. Um, yeah, so I don't know what route I'm going to do. I do know what route I'm going to go down. Uh, it might upset a few sort of uh, perfectionists, purists and all that. Um, but the trouble is with these cylinders, they're getting rarer and we're on sort of 30 thou over size. So the next size up is 40 thou, um, which when bantams were sort of kicking around as everyday transport, that, that was the end of it. But they now do a sort of 60 thou overbore. Um, I think they're slightly bigger as well. But realistically, we're sort of on the last rebore um, before that cylinder scrap. So what I intend to do is uh, hone out the cylinder a little bit and um, try and locate a new set of 30 thou oversized piston rings which are apparently like rocking horse poo. Um, but I'll see how I go on that one. If I can't get them, then I will go 40 thou oversize, do a rebore, which I'll attempt on the uh, bridge port. I think we can do it on there quite ably. Um, but I'm just hoping just to hone it up, put a new set of rings in, put up with a little bit of piston slap if it's there, but then that reduces the risk of seizures which is, you know, is a problem on two strokes. And also, you know, these sort of modern fuels, they do burn a lot hotter. 
So we might have a little bit more expansion on the piston. So we, you know, we might be all right. New set of rings, little, little bit of a hone. See how we go. But realistically, we're not going to be using it for work every day. We're not going to be going up to Land's End, John O'Groats. Um, the only thing I'm going to be doing is sort of uh, maybe racing Dean from uh, Retro Mechanica to a cafe for a cup of tea. Um, and uh, so, you know, the odd little run here and there. So it's not going to get overused. It's not going to get overstressed. So I don't think it's going to be a problem. So there you go. That's that's where we are so far. We've got our collection of new bits and bobs to go in. And uh, so, so we'll be cleaning it up and then starting to put it back together uh, and straightening things out like that crank. And um, yeah, and then in the next video, hopefully we'll be putting it back together. So till then, see you next time. Cheerio. All right. Yeah, Jenkins, it's uh, your natural history lesson. Come and have a look at it. Come on, come and have a look at this. To find out what horrors we've got on the inside. Um, damage we've got on the inner side of it. Um, got a few options.